but her specialties have blended very nicely with us field crop folks based on our current issues and that being the pigweed family. So Lynn has done a ton of work, continues to do a ton of work with, with the pigweeds, with Palmer amaranth, uh, uh, with water hemp. And, uh, you know, she has some exciting work going on right now that obviously we don't have results for, but uh, asked her to come on today and help us field crop, crop folks out in regards to, uh, you know, this whole dilemma. There's a lot of pigweeds out there and, you know, she's, she's taken some fantastic pictures, shared a lot of fantastic pictures with us here in field crops. And so I've asked her today to come and talk about this whole, this whole pigweed dilemma. And so Lynn, I'm gonna let you share your screen and, and go at okay. it. It says a uh, host is disabled participant screen sharing. Um, I can't, I can't share right now. Brandy's working on it. Okay. So Lynn is a participant, Brandy. Oh wait, now I've got it, let me. Whoop. All right, can you see that? I can see it. All right, so we're going to talk about um, pigweeds, particularly identifying pigweeds today. And then I'm going to give you a quick update about our herbicide resistance screening efforts in New York. So this is just our obligatory slide on um, why weeds are such a problem. Obviously, there's lots of reasons, whether they're disrupting ecosystems or they're hosts for pests or pathogens, but primarily to, to our agricultural producers, our horticultural producers, we're really concerned with the crop yield loss um, that they can precipitate. And that is substantial. This is some work that has been done uh, by weed scientists uh, throughout the U.S. where they've actually gone and they've uh, evaluated a lot of data from a lot of different crops and have kind of estimated what they anticipate the expected yield losses to be in our major agricultural commodities. And so something for um, like corn is that they're estimating that if weeds aren't managed, we're looking at a 50% yield loss uh, in the US and Canada with up to um, you know a loss of about $27 billion per year. So weeds have a real substantial physical financial impact on crop production practices and pig weeds especially so. So in the Weed Science Society of America uh, every year we, we get a survey that comes out and it asks us to rank and list the species in different commodities that are the most common species that we're dealing with and and the most troublesome species that we're dealing with. And this is the, the most recent two years worth of data. And you can see that pigweeds, just pigweeds in general, are ranked in the top five of the most common weeds and the most troublesome weeds that we're dealing with. And, and not necessarily even just within the top five, you know, um, species like Palmer amaranth and water hemp can, can rise to the top and our, our pigweed collective can be number one and number two. So pigweeds are substantial problems throughout the entire US. And that's why it's really important that we have this ability to identify them. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna focus on five weed species, Palmer amaranth, water hemp, smooth pigweed, pal amaranth, and red root. That's not to say we don't have more species, pigweeds in the New York. I can name at least three others that we've got, four others. But these are the ones that we're probably going to come into contact most in our agricultural production systems. So these three you might be familiar with, the red root amaranth, the smooth pigweed, the, the pal amaranth, and then there's two new species, newer species that we're dealing with, Palmer amaranth, which is native to the desert Southwest, but has rapidly expanded throughout the United States and is causing significant problems in a lot of our agricultural production regions. And then water hemp. Water hemp, which is originated in the Midwest and again is expanding its range. So why do we wanna talk about pigweed identification? Okay, we already discussed, I already put up the slide, they're common and they're troublesome weeds across systems. And you know, one reason why they are so troublesome is that some of these species, and I'm gonna target Palmer amaranth, can produce a lot of seed per plant. Palmer amaranth, large plants can produce up to a million seed per plant. 
And that's going to cause us problems across years. When you've got a species putting out 200,000, 500,000, a million seed, you're building up that seed bank and you're causing problems, not just in this year, but the year after, the year after, the year after. We also know that our pigweed populations throughout the United States, we have a lot of them that are resistant to one or more herbicides. And I'm going to point out again, Palmer amaranth and uh, water hemp. We have populations of these two plants that are resistant to five herbicide sites of action. And I just heard one yesterday in a talk that they've got in North Carolina, a Palmer amaranth that's resistant to six. So successful ID is really critical for developing an effective herbicide program to address resistance issues. Now, with that being said, at the seedling stages, two to three inches tall, when really post herbicides have to go out to maximize control, it's gonna be really hard to differentiate among these species. And if you wait till it, you can successfully identify them, it's probably getting too late to control. So that's why you have to be thinking about using a diversity of practices to control these um, from planting well through harvest. And Mike Stanyard, Mike Hunter, Josh Putman, everyone else can help you with those programs in your system. But we still need to be able to identify weeds, particularly if you've got escapes, because we wanna be inquiring about resistance screening and we wanna be using that knowledge to prepare for the following year. So we're gonna start off right now with smooth pigweed. I'm gonna tell you smooth pigweed is gonna be the one that's gonna be almost impossible to identify from red root pigweed. It's got oval to egg-shaped leaves. And these leaves can have wavy margins, which you can see on the plants in my picture here. These stems are gonna have hairs, but they are not gonna be as hairy as stems of red root pigweed. I'm gonna have a picture showing both stems together in the next uh, uh, following slide. Again, this is really similar to red root pigweed, and it's really difficult to identify this. I'm not gonna lie to you, even weed scientists, we probably aren't gonna be able to successfully ID this until about flowering. It's a tough one. Another pigweed species that we're dealing with here in New York is Powell amaranth. It's gonna have more diamond shaped leaves than that kind of oval to egg shaped leaves of, of smooth pigweed. They're gonna be a little bit deeper green. They're gonna have some hairs, but not a lot, or they might lack hairs at all. They've got a flowering structure. It's really not going to be as branched as some of our other pigweed species. And one thing that this species you'll notice is it's got bracts. They're gonna have long bracts that are gonna be useful for identifying it, but they're not gonna be as stiff as Palmer amaranth. And we're gonna discuss Palmer am amaranth bracts because if you grab a seed head from Palmer amaranth, that thing hurts and you'll know you're grabbing a Palmer amaranth. Red root pigweed, this is the species that's gonna be really hard to identify from smooth amaranth. Again, it has those oval to egg shaped leaves with the wavy margins, but this species, look for the hairs. It is very, very, very hairy. The stems are hairy. The edges of the leaves are hairy. The undersides of the leaves, particularly the veins are hairy. If you look in this picture in the upper left-hand corner, you can actually see those hairs on the veins on the other side of that leaf. And that's gonna be one of those keys that we're gonna be looking for to tell this species apart. It's gonna have much more compact flower heads and I've got a picture coming up. So again, smooth versus pal versus red roof. These are gonna look alike at very young developmental stages and smooth and red root are gonna be really difficult to distinguish until we hit that flowering stage. I mean, just look at those leaves. They're, they're hard to tell apart. You might have some ID keys if we're looking at the stems. Pal amaranth is going to be the least hairy of all of these three species. It's gonna have some to none. Smooth amaranth is gonna be next in the hairiness and then there's gonna be red root. That is going to have the most hairs. Again, it's gonna be on the leaves. It's gonna be on the undersides of the leaves on the veins. We had talked about the, how the seed heads can differ from each other. Now these pictures were taken in a greenhouse so they're not gonna necessarily uh, reflect what we might see in the field. But you know, smooth pigweed is gonna be much more branched than those other two. The pal amaranth is gonna have those spines, but they're not gonna be sharp like palmer amaranth. And the red root pigweed is gonna be branched, but it's gonna be much more tight and compact and have shorter little flower head branches. 
The next two species we want to talk about are our dioecia species and the ones I am most worried about right now in New York. The first one is Palmer amaranth. We only have this in three counties right now, but I'm worried about it moving around and getting it in more counties because this is a bad, bad, bad plant if it gets established. This has diamond shaped leaves, not unlike the Powell amaranth, but there is a real key feature for identifying Palmer amaranth and that is you have petioles that are longer than the leaf blade. When this plant starts to get some size on it, those petioles are long, long, long. All the other amaranths have short petioles. That's that stem that the leaf is attached to, okay? It may have a white chevron or V-shaped watermark on the leaf surface, but don't use that as an identifying, you know, characteristic all times because a lot of times it doesn't show up. The stems of Palmer amaranth are gonna be pretty smooth. There might be occasional hairs, but not a lot. These plants are large, 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 and I've got pictures to show. You will know Palmer amaranth when you run into it. It is big. It's got male and female flowers on separate plants. All of our previously discussed pigweeds all had our male and female flowers together. So if you find a pigweed and you don't see any pollen coming off of it, you've got one of two dioecia species, Palmer amaranth and water hemp. And like I said, the flowers have sharp bracts and I'll show you those in a minute. The other dioecious species we're worried about here in New York is water hemp. It's kind of unique and I think it stands out compared to some of the other pigweeds with its dark green glossy and linear to kind of oval shaped leaves. Stems are smooth like Palmer amaranth. Again, it gets big, not as big as Palmer, but it can get tall. And like Palmer amaranth, it also has separate female and male plants. This is what I'm talking about when I'm saying dioecious, male and females on separate plants. Here's a picture of the male flowers. These are the anthers. If you look all the way to the left of the slide, those yellow anthers, those are going to break open and that yellow pollen is going to be dispersed. The picture right next to it is a close up of Palmer amaranth's female flowers, okay? And those are the stigmas and that's where the pollen is going to land. And right on the Palmer amaranth, you can see those sharp, stiff, pointed bracts. That's if you grab the Palmer amaranth flower head, you're going to, those are going to poke you. They are stiff and they're going to hurt. On the right hand side of the slide, again, our water hemp, our males and females. Again, if you see uh, anthers on one plant, and no anthers, no yellow, and polis, ye yellow pollen sacs on the other, you're dealing with one of these two dioecious amaranths and that's gonna be um, a key identifying feature. So we talked about the dioecious amaranths, they're gonna have smooth stems. There might be occasional little hairs on it, but they're really, really smooth. They're gonna be green to red in color. Not to say that the other amaranths can't have red stems, but I think the colors tend to pop out on the palmer and on the water hemp because of their architecture and how they hold their branches. You can really see them and they really stand out. And some of those plants, you even kind of get that red green alternating color. So to, to differentiate between the palmer and the water hemp, if you're looking at a dioecious plant, again, water hemp has that dark green, long linear leaves. Palmer amaranth is diamond shaped. That center picture, when you flip, if you just bend that petiole over and hold it up against the leaf, Palmer amaranth is gonna be much, 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 much longer than any other pigweed species out there. And if you look down at these from you know, a top view down, I think they have a real distinct appearance. Palmer amaranth is gonna look like a poinsettia plant, to be honest, um, before it gets big and starts flowering, if you start looking down at it. If you want to tell the palmer and the water hemp apart, if the leaves aren't enough, I'm going to tell you palmer amaranth is going to have a thicker, longer flower head and those bracts. You can see the bracts in the, uh, the palmer amaranth flower head I'm holding in my hand. They are noticeable and they are sharp. Again, they will hurt. Uh, palmer amaranth flowers, both the male and the female, are more tightly clustered together on the stem than the water hemp. So if you look at the little arrow I've got on the water hemp picture, see how there's that gap? There's a cluster of flowers and then a gap and then a cluster of flowers and a gap. That's what water hemp is going to look like. It's going to have those gaps, whereas palmer amaranth is going to be tight. 
clustered together. You're not going to see uh, as many, um, you know, spaces between those flowers as you do on the water hemp. So I actually think Palmer versus Powell is going to be a tricky idea in the future if Palmer becomes more widespread because of those diamond shaped leaves. So what you really want to be doing is if you've got a plant with diamond shaped leaves, be looking at those petioles. Again, Palmer amaranth is going to have those petioles that as this plant gets older, they are going to get longer than the leaf blade itself. So if it's a real short petiole, you're probably dealing with, palm, uh, with Powell amaranth and not Palmer. Now, both of those species have chevrons. So does um, red root pigweed can also have a chevron, that watermark on the leaf blade. So don't use that as necessarily a crucial ID tool because we can see it across species. So one thing I did just want to bring up, I talked about palmer amaranth growing larger in height and volume than all other pigweed species. This is big. This is a big, big, big plant. This is palmer amaranth on the edge of a silage cornfield. This is Palmer amaranth in an almond orchard in California, okay? These are, we are talking heights of 10 feet that this plant can get to. This is a Palmer amaranth growing on the roadside in um, uh, Merced County, California, where I came from uh, prior to starting at Cornell. And uh, that's a picture of my hand. And that is not the main stem of the plant. That is just one branch. So Palmer amaranth has an ability to gain a significant size and become a significant problem. And this plant is easily producing a million plus seed. So for 2021, we really wanna get into making a pigweed identification guide. Uh, we wanna get that out there and into growers hands to really help you. So you can just flip it out and, and help you identify pigweeds in the field. Dr. Yu Jiang, who's a digital ag specialist, and I have got a program. If you know a, a student who's in their second or third year of schooling as an undergrad who wants to maybe be involved in this project, uh, tell them to go look at the Summer Scholars Program. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be growing all of these amaranth species out. We're going to be uh, taking pictures of them, and we're going to be doing a novel 3D imaging of them, and we're going to be building a guide, but we're going to be building a website where you can actually see 3D models of these weeds and you at different growth stages, and you can turn them around, and you can actually see physically differences in their leaf shape, their growth habit, their plant architecture, and other traits. So now I just want to jump on to herbicide resistance. Um, we know that Palmer amaranth and Water hemp have resistance issues in the US, so do our other pigweed species. So we do wanna be thinking about herbicide resistance screening here in New York, okay? And the herbicide resistance situation is dire. Throughout the world, we have 514 cases of herbicide resistance. We have 26 known herbicide sites of action. We have resistance somewhere in the world to 23 of them. And the United States leads the way with 165 cases of herbicide resistance. So we really need to be thinking about this when we're thinking about weed control. Corn is a crop where we have a lot of herbicide resistance that has developed throughout the world. And in the US, we have a lot of acres and heavy reliance on herbicides for weed control. And if you think about the herbicides where we have most of our resistance cases developing, ALS inhibitors, photosystem 2, uh, glyphosate, auxins, okay? We see a lot of these in our agronomic cropping systems. We see a lot of use of these products. And, you know, we have a lot of acres of agronomic crops, and that's why we've got issues. I do want to talk about herbicide resistance. Spraying a herbicide on a weed does not make it resistant. This isn't like getting bit by a radioactive spider in a comic book, and now you've got special traits. These resistance traits are already out there in, in, the, in our populations in the field, okay? These are genetic mutations that are just happening randomly. And they are out there and we find them if when we start to use or overuse herbicides, okay? So this was a study that was done in France and they actually went and took 734 dried specimens of black grass and they cut little pieces of tissue out and they were able to extract DNA and they collected these plants. Um, these plants were collected between 1788 and 1975 and they found one plant that was collected in 1888 that had a gene, the, a gene 
that confers resistance or uh, that has a mutation that confers resistance to the grass herbicides. So a hundred years before the grass herbicides were released, there was a plant already resistant to those products. So that's what I want you to understand. This is an evolutionary process. Those genes are out there. How we use our products, you know, determines how quickly resistance develops and how widespread it becomes. In New York, uh, the work uh, has uh, a little bit outdated with respect to our, our herbicide resistance. Uh, we haven't had anything new posted on our official herbicide resistance uh, tracking website since the 1990s. Um, but we know that we have herbicide species combinations, horseweed, palmer amaranth, water hemp, pal amaranth, and more here in New York that are uh, resistant. So we've started a herbicide resistant screening program at Cornell Agritech. We're starting off with horseweed. I know this is a big problem, particularly with these soybean guys. Um, and we want to, you know, we want to be, be checking this species out because we know in the United States we have resistance to glyphosate. We have resistance to the ALS herbicides. We have resistance to paraquat and we have resistance to our photosystem 2 inhibitors. So this past year, we have collect got seed from 30 populations of horseweed from around New York. We grew them in the greenhouse. We're currently growing them in the greenhouse and we sprayed them at about the seven to 10 leaf stage with 22 ounces of Roundup PowerMax just to do an initial bioassay to see what we're dealing with in New York, uh, develop our uh, resistance studies further. And these are the results. Higher bars mean that we have a susceptible population so right now, only three of our populations that we have seed that we collected from are showing any kind of susceptibility to Roundup. And these populations were collected from roadsides, from soybean fields, from orchards, from vineyards. Three populations are sensitive out of the 30 that we screened, two are mixed, but they had resistant plants and dead plants mixed together, okay? So we always suspected that horseweed and glyphosate were probably a bad combination, but now we're starting to see the results that we probably do have widespread resistance in the state. We also had some calls this summer about suspected paraquat resistance in one orchard and one vineyard. So we did a preliminary screen of horseweed in the greenhouse, and I am happy to say that we did screen um, these three populations. We screened them with uh, multiple rates of, of paraquat and we didn't see any resistance. We pretty much killed them with all the rates. So that we're feeling good about. Again, resistance to glyphosate we've detected. Fortunately, we think we don't have the paraquat resistance. We went out into the field to these sites, sprayed them again. Uh, you can see a little bit of green on this one. It was an apple orchard. I think there was an apple leaf laying on that when it got sprayed. So we are seeing the resistant or the susceptibility in the field, in the greenhouse. So there's probably other things going on about uh, why growers probably suspected resistance. Maybe it was the size or the timing, the treatments, their rates, their GPA, the coverage, temperature, humidity, light conditions. By the way, Horseweed that's resistant to paraquat, it's not going to show a response at all. It's going to look like it was never even touched with the herbicide. At least that's my experience from California. No burning, maybe a little bit of stunting. That's, that's, that is what we have seen uh, in our populations out west. What's next with resistant screening? Obviously, we're going to continue with the horseweed. We're going to rerun the glyphosate screen. We're going to identify populations for formal dose response studies, and we're going to do other herbicide groups. With the palmer amaranth, the water hemp, and the pal amaranth, the pigweed, we're also going to be screening for uh, several herbicide classes. Uh, we've got some indications that we've got um, uh, poor responses to glyphosate, to the ALS inhibitors, to the auxins. Common lambs quarters, we had some problems in snap beans this year. So we're doing some screening for resistance to bentasan. And we're also gonna be looking at population or herbicides that we still have sensitivity to, to try and identify that variability in our New York weed populations to see if we can see if there's any impending resistance on the horizon. 
With respect to herbicide resistance, you've got to ask yourself questions. Did you apply the right herbicide, right rate, right time, right volume, okay? Were there weather conditions or environmental conditions that could have affected performance? Is there any kind of patterns to suggest maybe you just had a clogged nozzle or some other application issue? But if you've got live plants intermixed with dead plants of the same species and they were all the same size when treated, or live plants of a susceptible species intermixed with dead plants of other susceptible species, and your problem is getting worse over time, and you know there's other cases of resistance around, that's when I want you to call us because we want to be able to get on top of our resistance situations and get these identified and managed. So again, if you think you have susceptible or you have herbicide resistance, contact a CCE specialist or myself. Thanks to all the CCE specialists who collected our populations and uh, we look forward to working with them next year. Man, fantastic, Lynn. I love those pictures. <laughs> guides. To so come. I'm going to throw one thing out there, Mike, what I'm really hoping one, those pictures and better pictures are going to go into that pigweed guide. I am committed to making that happen within the next year, uh, certainly for at least the start of field season 2022. Uh, what I would like to do, COVID willing, and with the help from you and Mike and Josh and everyone else, is uh, hopefully this year we can do a pigweed roadshow where I can grow those pigweeds out, and I can bring all of those pigweed species to you and your growers this summer. And we can just have like a, like a little day. Okay, here's Palmer, here's Smooth, here's Red Root, here's Water Hemp, here's Pal, all next to each other. And everyone can get up close and look at them and we can talk about those traits, which sometimes are easier to see when you can just look right at the plant in front of you and not a picture on a screen. Yeah, that would be great here. I'm, I'm Looking into quite, Jeff Miller had the only question in the question and answer box here. Do you foresee developing an app that growers can use to take a picture of a pigweed plant and be able to ID it? Yeah, so here's the, here's the thing. We are not gonna do that. There are a couple of apps out there. iNaturalist, PlantNet, uh, PlantSeek, PlantSnap. There's a, there's a few apps out there to, to do it. They're not really great on the pigweeds. Um, now, um, I'm not sure that we're going to do that. Like I said, we're going to have the website that people can go to that it's going to have the 3D images. You can try using those apps, but I'm going to tell you the entomologists have a little bit of concern with those apps right now because they're not getting curated as rapidly or as well as they should. And so there's a lot of incorrect IDs getting in there and that's uh, reducing the efficacy of those, of, of those apps for identification. So. There are apps out there. We're not necessarily going to do one ourselves. We are going to have a web page, though, hopefully, that's going to have all of these pictures, better pictures, and those 3D models of the weeds. Great. Well, fantastic. Um, perfect timing. Uh, <laughs> and I saw someone had, had mentioned adjuvants and surfactants. Yeah, you know. You got to make sure you're reading that label and you are you are using the products you're supposed to be using with these herbicides. Um, you know, I, I, I have asked some of our growers like, OK, you know, did you did you did you put you know, did you use AMS as your water hard? And it's uh, no, like, OK, well, that's going to reduce efficacy with glyphosate. So you've got to be you've got to be thinking not only your herbicides, but you've got to be thinking about the products that go in the tank with the herbicides and the water quality itself. All right, Lynn, thank you. We're out of time, but if there's other questions, Lynn, you know, we can we can get uh, your questions to Lynn and we can get I can, to- I can hang and answer in the chat if you need. Okay, that'd be awesome. That'd be great. All right, next up, we made it through our first virtual speaker. It went pretty, pretty well. I noticed some problems out there. We're, we're getting some messages back and forth, trying to help people out. We knew there would be some issues out there, but uh, overall, I think it's, it's gone very well. Our second speaker, Jamie Cummings. I can say Jamie, Jamie is the former New York State IPM specialist uh, with the New York State IPM program here. I think as of yesterday, uh, Jamie has started a new position uh, with, with Syngenta as, as their, their tech rep over there. So uh, we're gonna miss Jamie. You'll see her again. She's gonna talk about soybean cyst nematodes uh, next month for us uh, on our soybean Congress. But today she's gonna talk about some of the seed treatment work for Seacorn maggot um, and looking at neonic alternatives. 
for us on some research that uh, she's worked with a couple of us across the state. So Jamie, it's all yours. Great, thanks Mike, good morning. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I can hear you and, and see slides. And see you, yep. All right, see you. well great, thanks a lot. Good morning, it's great to be here. Um, and I'll just jump right in. So uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, some, the neonic seed treatments, uh, some trial work that we did and some of the issues surrounding some of the proposed legislation um, surrounding these chemistries. So for anybody who's grown corn, you're, you're very well aware that we have a number of um, problems early season, including some insect pests. Some of the major ones would be seed corn maggot, wireworm, white grubs, black cutworm, slugs, and armyworm. And uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of these problems. Um, the good news is that most of these are very well managed by our seed treatments, particularly our neonic seed treatments. Um, the chemistries would be thiamethoxam, clothianidin, and imidacloprid, or you may know them better as cruiser, gaucho, poncho, or possibly some other uh, trade names. Um, so we've been very fortunate that for many, many years now, we have gotten a lot of these pests under control simply through the um, efficacy and uh, convenience of these seed treatments. But uh, as many of you also probably know, unless you've been under a rock, these chemistries are um, under fire a little bit. Uh, we've, there's been a lot of legislation proposed to ban either some or all uses of neonex entirely in New York State. Um, many of you are probably also aware that there was a pollinator risk assessment that was contracted to go out through Cornell University. Um, Dr. Scott McArt led that um, this publication and basically it's a big meta analysis and synopsis of a lot of research and data available from both around the USA, North America and globally um, where they wanted to look at and analyze the uh, benefits uh, like a cost benefit analysis of neonix in every cropping system um, in New York State. Uh, this, this was a very comprehensive and um, long planned out study. Uh, however, there it's worth noting that there was very little data from actually from New York State and a lot of the pest pressure studies, especially in the um, neonic seed treatment trials, was very low. Um, so uh, you have to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. So, um, so we have had these neonics uh, for quite a while, but um, so the question would be is whether or not the seed corn maggot is even still an issue in New York corn and soybean. And the answer of course is yes. But the problem is that these pests are very sporadic and they're highly unpredictable. But when they do happen, you can get between three and 8,000 plants uh, lost per acre, which is pretty significant. Um, and the reason partly that this is so uh, sporadic and unpredictable is, you know, a lot of our corn and soybean acreage has been planted with these treated seeds for almost 20 years. So we've had some pest suppression for a couple decades now, um, but that doesn't mean that those pests aren't still out there and just waiting for the perfect opportunity, which they're very drawn to fields that have especially high organic inputs, like many of our fields that receive manure or have cover crops either terminated or tilled in. And we do still have um, significant losses that are reported annually. And in uh, 2020, uh, these are just the ones we heard about. Uh, you know, there was at least 600 acres um, up in Northern New York lost. Uh, out in Western New York, there was a couple big fields that had total replants required due to seed corn maggot. And then we got some other reports of six to 12% stand losses throughout the state. And then of course, this is just the ones that we've heard about and you know, it's worth noting that there's a lot more losses out there that um, did not make it to us to include in this list. And one of the things that, if you don't know, um, a lot of the sweet corn or untreated seeds are transplanted specifically because of seed corn maggot. And that goes to show you how problematic these pests can be in fields that do not have um, these seed treatments on. 
So that's seed corn maggot, but what about the other pests, the wire worm and the white grubs? And absolutely, these are still problematic here in New York State. Um, we know that we have a lot of sods, and now especially more and more, a lot more cover crops that are in our rotations. And those are the fields that are very, um, they're susceptible to these pests because that's where they like to be. And actually a lot of the cover crop success in New York State has been due to the adoption of these neonic seed treatments to suppress these pests. So we know we have these pests here, but you know the big question of course, and this was tried to be addressed with that pollinator risk assessment is whether or not they actually cause economic losses to justify the use of these seed treatments. Um, and we definitely know that the seed corn maggot was probably one of the most significant issues in corn um, prior to the neonic seed treatments. Uh, however, we have limited data available that measured specific economic losses in the state. Um, and we do know that some crops, especially soybean, they can compensate for some stand loss. Uh, and also most of the national and international research, especially summarized in the risk assessment, shows little to no economic benefit to the widespread adoption of these neonic seed treatments in the field, um, field crops. And, uh, you know, if you're interested in seeing a lot of that, like I said, that pollinator risk assessment uh, has a very long list of the studies that they summarize. But uh, with all that being said, you know, we'd like to probably look at a little bit more local research here in New York State since our cropping systems don't align very well with, say, the Midwest or other areas where most of the data analyzed uh, came from. And of course, we need to consider if these seed treatments are banned or if neonics are banned, um, what are going to be our alternatives? And you know, we could go and say, well, no, no insecticide seed treatment at all, which would be, you know, no protection. And that would be like the organic sweet corn people that uh, experience serious losses if they don't, um, you know, do transplanting. Or we could go back to in furrow or banded insecticide treatments. Um, you know, that was a very popular tool uh, back in the day, but we might be going backwards um, using older, more toxic chemistries. And of course, that's going to be more product, more active ingredient applied per acre. Um, and part of the goal of these proposed bans is to, you know, minimize and eliminate um, excessive pesticide use in the field. So that's not typically or generally a, a good uh, substitution. But then we also have another option, which is these anthranilic diamide seed treatments. Um, the chemistries for those are chlorantranilipral or cyantranilipral, and you might know these as Lumivia or Fertenza. These chemistries definitely are less toxic to bees, um, but do we really want to move in the direction where we're just going to simply substitute one chemistry for another? And especially with the diamides, there's uh, plenty of documented issues with resistance, insect resistance, um, to the, these chemistries in other cropping systems. And another thing to consider is diamides are more expensive than the neonics. So considering all these things, um, we just we came together as the field crops uh, team to um, think about what we needed to do to address these issues. Uh, so of course, we wanted to think about evaluating the efficacy of these alternatives, uh, such as the diamide seed treatments. And then also, I'm sure most people are familiar with the biological control, the entomopathogenic nematodes that Elson Shield has been working on for many years for um, other pests. And one of the other things you know, that would be really important is we need to start documenting the losses caused by these pests that are contr controlled by the neonics to help balance that um, risk risk benefit uh, analysis that said that there is no economic benefit um, so that we can start looking at that and uh, provide more accurate uh, answers and data. So we decided uh, in 2019 that we were going to do some statewide trials, replicated trials uh, to compare the neonics and the diamide seed treatments. So the treatments, we had three treatments at, uh, for each location, all the plots had a fungicide so that we weren't confounding damping off or other early season disease problems. And then they were either fungicide alone or with the diamide or with the neonic. We had planned four locations for each year and uh, replicated um, randomized complete block. And we would conduct um, very 
intensive stand counts um, for every replication. And yes, we uh, did dig up every skip <laughs> in those stand counts to confirm whether it was um, caused by pests like seed corn maggot or wireworm, or if it was just a, a planter skip or something else. So we were quantifying exactly every lost emergence that was out there. And then of course we hope to um, capture the yield. So this came together in 2019 very rapidly on extremely short notice. I think it was the end of March, early April, when we learned that we might want to be looking at this. So that's pretty last minute to throw together um, statewide replicated trials for anybody who works on this sort of things. And I really want to uh, give a big shout out to all of our collaborators, the farmers who last minute uh, volunteered to donate their time and land, uh, Seedway and Syngenta for donating the seed and the seed treatment chemistries. And of course the extension um, specialists around the state who volunteered uh, last minute to make this a priority. However, if you think back to the spring of 2019, most of you will remember that it was extremely wet. There was a lot of prevented planting around the state, and that included three of our four planned trials. So we only got one um, one trial in the ground uh, in 2019. And unfortunately, we didn't have um, high enough pest pressure there to be able to differentiate the treatment. So you see the table there. Um, those are the mean stand counts. Um, they weren't differentiable at, in any way. But in 2020, we had more time um, to come back together. Same collaborators uh, jumped on this. And we did get the four locations. We received funding, thank you to New York uh, Corn and Soybean Growers Association. And we were able to get all four trials planted in a timely manner and according to the protocol. So that was great. Uh, however, once again, um, there was very low pest pressure. And we always say, if you wanna solve a disease or pest problem, just try to do research on it because uh, then you won't get the problem and you can say, it's not a problem. Um, <laughs> so once again, with the stand counts, what you see in the table or the figure here, this was across all four locations. Um, there was no significant difference among stand counts among all the treatments. Uh, if we break that out by individual locations, again, looking at stand counts, we had Western New York, Eastern New York, so, so, excuse me, South Central New York and Central New York. Um, no clear pattern here. None of the individual locations were significant either. And we can't even say that any of the treatments, you know, trended to do better overall, unfortunately. Uh, and then when we look at yield, unfortunately, we were only able to get yield for three of the locations. Um, but when we look at that, again, based, you know, what you would kind of expect with if there was no difference in stand counts, there was really no significant difference among the yields either. Um, so that's unfortunate. And again, when we look at all of the individual trials, again, there was no clear pattern on for any of the treatments to draw any strong conclusions. So what did we learn? Well, <laughs> it confirmed, you know, what we already know is that seed corn maggot is quite unpredictable. And that of course, when you don't have pest pressure, you're not gonna have any damage and you're not gonna be able to differentiate among your treatments. And this is really similar to what was in that, uh, the pollinator risk assessment. They used all studies where there was no pest pressure and therefore could say that the treatments conferred no benefit. Um, but this isn't to say that we didn't have any losses in either of these years because we definitely did and I showed you some examples of those. But what we did, of course, learn or confirm is that, as would be expected, the diamides didn't have any negative effect um, on emergence uh, or stand counts or yield. Um, but we did notice at one place it was more observational was that the wireworm damage was worse in the diamide than the neonic plots. And actually this is something that they're noticing up in Canada and um, they're starting to look a little bit more into that. So that might be an issue that they're gonna have to um, deal with. And although it wasn't statistically significant, we did see in our data that across all the trials the neonics did tend to yield higher regardless of the stand counts, but again, not significantly. So moving forward, we really need to start thinking about managing these early season pests from an IPM or integrated pest management um, perspective. 
And we don't want to just swap one chemistry for another. So we want to be looking at those biocontrol nematodes and perhaps using growing degree day models to adjust planting dates to avoid the times of the worst pest pressure. However, I do say that with the understanding that sometimes here in New York, we get out in the fields and plant just when we can and, uh, you know, based on the weather. And so this isn't obviously, you know, a, a perfect option. So what can we learn? Uh, because we are not the first uh, area or region to go through this, these proposed legislative bans. If we learn from what happened up in Ontario, where they did go ahead, what happened, the government imposed 80% uh, mandatory reduction of all neonic use. And, you know, we here in New York, we tend to complain that we don't have as many pesticide options as other states. We have more regulations. Well, up there in Ontario, they had even fewer. Um, and one of the things that happened was that the legislation put the, the growers had to prove a need for to be able to use the neonics. So the burden of proof was on the growers. It was very time consuming or difficult or sometimes impossible. It required regulated inspections. There was a backlog of inspectors. And then even if they were able to go out, there was a backlog of being able to get the data put in. Um, it was kind of a mess. There was a major backlash from their growers and of course the industry. And so what happened was they just ended up doing a complete swap out for um, the neonics for the diamides. And uh, you know what came of that was basically no positive change for the pollinators, which was what this whole ban was supposed to help. So what what else we learned is that you know these these were very one sided regulations. The growers were the ones that had to go undergo very extensive neonic trainings to be able to prove that they needed it and understand it to be able to use these things. Um, whereas the beekeepers they didn't have to undergo any sort of training um, to address you know other uh, causes of bee kill issues or any sort of certification for hive management. And then there were no follow-up surveys to determine the benefits or, or lack thereof of um, banning these products. And what else we learned was that, you know, the industry, the seed companies and the chemistry company, they just stopped selling neonic seed treatments in Ontario because it was just too difficult to overcome the regulations to be able to use them. And we know again with when we switch to the diamides that they're, they're definitely more persistent in the soils. And we know that um, it's, it's likely that there could be some resistance issues to develop. So there was a lot of research going up on up there, some very great research too, um, that showed that the bee kills were primarily from the vacuum planters and that it was the planter dust that was the issue and you know this isn't a surprise to anybody now we all know this but they did some very technical good technical research to figure this out and so their question was why don't we regulate the dust right and there was a few ways to do that including improved um, seed poly coating polymers how about some of those improved um, fluency agents and then you know modifications for the planters to resolve aimed at reducing dust. So let's look at those individually. When we think about um, improving those po seed coating polymers, there was a big push by the seed companies to do this. They wanted to avoid those bans. Um, and there was a lot of great improvements. And some of these polymers showed really great promise. Um, but what happened was because the regulatory changes went through and they banned them, there was no urgency really to continue this R&D. Um, so it was a priority shift. And then also one thing that was encountered was polymers equals microplastics. And, you know, there's increased scrutiny um, with environmentalists and even the general public on microplastics in the environment. So that was going to be another hurdle. Uh, these fluency agents, there's, as you know, they're supposed to reduce the friction, which would thereby reduce the active ingredient in the dust that's being vented out. And in the lab, these fluency agents showed great promise and everything looked great and they could show the reduction, measure it, and it looked perfect. But for some reason, when it went out in the field, that reduction wasn't translated. And um, there was a lot of questions, why was this happening? And some really great research by Jocelyn Smith, Tracy Body, and Art Shafsma um, looked into this and what they were able to determine was that it was the soil that was the abrasive factor 
regardless of the fluency agent. So basically the, these planters were sucking up a little bit of the soil, it was getting in on the seed and that was um, scratching up the seeds and um, blowing it off target. Um, and if you're interested, that paper at the bottom is uh, where they did this, this elegant research to figure that out. So then the next option, of course, was planter exhaust system modifications. Um, they know that some of these modifications could have very big impact in reducing um, off-target movement. For some reason, some of the major manufacturers had reluctance to make these modifications. And then, of course, once the bans went through, the regulatory changes made it no longer a priority at all. There was no incentive for them to do so. Regardless of the fact that all the research up there showed that these modifications could totally fix the problem and avoid the ban. So maybe that should be our priority. The other thing we learned um, from Ontario's ban was that, you know, we really all need to come together. This can't be a, a two sided argument and people fighting. So we need to bring grow our grow, bring our growers together, our educators, our industry folks, legislators, the beekeepers, we need to bring everybody together and really talk about this so that we can be making some very educated decisions based on research and science, not based on emotions. Um, so we need to learn from what happened up in Ontario. We need to make informed decisions. We need to understand the consequences of just outright banning things and focus on integrated pest management. And why is that? Because here in New York, this is what a lot of our acreage looks like. Um, we all probably have a good idea of this. This is, you know, corn and soybeans are a couple of our very top um, acreage and also value in our agricultural economy. And we already talked about all these early season pests, right? So we know they're here, they're a problem. And um, we have these great seed treatments that work well for them. They're, um, you know, pretty safe. And we know that we uh, also that these pests are not going to be going away. They're not going to magically disappear just because somebody wants to ban the seed treatments that we use. Um, a lot of New York state acreage is very vulnerable to these pests because of we are a big dairy state. We have a lot of manured fields. Um, we have a lot of increased adoption of cover crops. And of course, we also have a lot of sods in our rotation. Um, and we also know that, you know, losses to seed corn maggot and wireworm, they're very sporadic and inconsistent. But as you can see in this photo, when they do happen, they can be quite significant and devastating. So, um, that leads us to some questions here. So are these neonic seed treatments necessary on all acreage? Probably not, um, but it's challenging to get these seed options. We have to think about it from you know the industry, the manufacturing perspective. Um, it's hard to have all these different you know, specified seed treatments on the packages when you think about all the varieties that are sold and then you start thinking about you know, picking the specific products that go on them, it's challenging. So should we do what happened in Ontario, which is just swap the neonics for the diamides? I'd say the answer is no for that. Um, maybe have a mix of both, um, but we, options are the are uh, key here and looking at it from an IPM perspective. So may, should we be looking at mitigating dust from the planters? I'd say yes. I think that you know this research was very well outlined up in Ontario. They proved this. They know that this is going to work. Um, we also know that probably less than 30% of the corn planters in New York are vacuum planters. Um, and so maybe we, instead of looking at legislation to ban the chemistries, maybe they could change the focus of those regulations for possibly planter modifications. And of course, as I already said, you know, alternative management options, those biocontrol nematodes, possibly adjusting planting dates when it's possible. Um, and how about improving communication with our beekeepers? You know, that's a big thing that happens in other states. Um, like I'm thinking like out in California where they have big orchards, you know, they have apps that link the growers with um, the beekeepers and they communicate, you know, on such and such days that there's gonna be applications or plantings and the beekeepers can keep their, try to keep their bees in the hives for the day. Um, with that, I just want to say thank you to everybody, including New York Corn and Soybean Growers Association for funding the trials. Again, Seedway and Syngenta for donating products, the farmers for their time in land, and of course, um, the collaborators on here, Mike, Janice, Aaron, Kevin, and Eric for uh, everything that you guys did to help make these trials possible.
And for anybody who hasn't seen seed corn maggot, they're gross little things there. I know that's soybeans, but I'll, if I have a minute for questions, I'll take that. If not, I'll give you Mike his time for the next person. Fantastic, Jamie. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was one question in the question box, Jamie. Um, yep, I, I read the compound carriers in the neo insecticide are more of the problem than the insecticide itself. Researchers said that what keeps the insecticide on the insect's feet's pads. Do you agree? Some of the fluencies, uh, some of the dusts and things. I have never seen anything about keeping it on the insect's feet or pads. I wouldn't know, Mike. You're the entomologist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a, a, a formulation expert. Um, so I would say that I'm not the best person to answer that question. I'd be interested if you read it, if whoever gave that question, if you've read it somewhere, you know, send it on uh, in an email to Mike or myself and we'll look at it and try and get back to you. But that's an interesting yeah. one I haven't heard. But I, I think you showed the problem is not the, is, is more the, you know, the carriers and compounds. The, the insecticide itself. Um, yeah. But yeah, I haven't heard anything about that being more of a carrying agent, uh, you know, for the insects. Yeah. So, good question. Yeah. That wasn't from me, Mike. That was from Dave V. Well, Tipka, yep. Dave with Tipka. And if he has any follow up, somebody could unmute him and he could ask. I lost that ability. Okay. Uh, someone else asked about uh, how does crop rotation help? So, yes and no, not well. I, it's they're everywhere. They're mobile. They do overwinter. Mike, do you want to take that? You, I feel like you're, you know, this stuff, and you'll. Yeah, I don't know how this. crop. I mean, it's, it's a planting time situation. Mm -hmm. so crop rotation. So yeah, we can help with some of the insects. You know, obviously with seed corn maggot. But this, like, like Jamie showed, it's very sporadic. Certain conditions, if they line up, we're going to have it. Um, so crop rotation, most, you know, we're talking about seed corn maggot. They're pests in all seeds. So any kind of a large seed from vegetable to corn, soybean, they're, they're not really host specific. So whatever crop you grow, whether it be a grass, obviously, or something like that, wheat, you're not going to have maybe seed corn maggot problems. But um, yeah, crop rotation can help with some of these pests, but um, Main them are pests on multiple crops. Yeah, and some of our rotations actually make them worse, right? When we're coming out of our hay sods and things. So. <laughs> sure, sure, and you know, uh, where a lot of dairies, a lot of a lot of manure uh, can can lead to those problems also. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, well, thank continue, you. you know, Jamie, you I mean I think you're going to continue? I don't know if you're going to hang around. There's other questions. If you could answer them, if you see something in the question box. Sure thing. Yep, I can, I can do that. I can always forward you something. Um, again, Jimmy, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for your time. I appreciate everybody's attention. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to take a five-minute break before Gary Bergstrom comes on. We're in pretty good time, but I'd like to take a five-minute break. We've been on for, uh, you know, for, two, for an hour. I know that's a lot for you guys. If you haven't done this before, sitting in front of the computer for an hour. Some of us have been doing this for nine months, so our, we've got a little, we're calloused on our backsides from sitting in front of these, these meetings so much. So let's just take five minutes, uh, run, get a drink, just stretch, close your eyes, and we'll be back with Gary Bergstrom at 11.05. All right, thanks. Mike, you want me to set up with the share screen? Have it ready yeah, to go? let's do that. Do you have... You, Oh, oh, you know, Gary, we're going to take a couple minutes. We want to show uh, the sponsor slides for a couple minutes. I okay, go for it. There we go.
What do you say, Mike? Want to load up? 11.05, here we go. All right, so we're gonna talk about some diseases now. And our, our plant pathologist, Gary Bergstrom, is gonna kind of give us an overview here of corn and maybe one in particular right here that we're not finding yet, but it's awful close, isn't it? It is, it is. All right, take it away. I'll show screen here and uh, we'll do this. There you and go. Like, like other, uh, is it showing up now? Yep. All right, go, go to presentation uh, mode, you'd be good. It'd be good, okay. All right, well, pleasure to be here. Um, wish we could see everybody in person and then we'll, uh, we'll go for that in a year. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to speak with you this morning and uh, hopefully be able to answer some questions you might have. So uh, I wanna start out with kind of a general update of the year and, and uh, what, we, what we've seen and not seen in terms of uh, corn diseases. And then kind of drill down on a couple of things in particular. Uh, want to drill down on this new disease that's kind of uh, expanding rapidly from the Midwest outward. Uh, that is tar spot, uh, a fungal leaf spot disease. And also spend a little bit of time on uh, a new uh, fungicide uh, option. This is uh, 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 applying a fungicide at planting in the furrow. Uh, with the new technology from FMC Corporation. So those are the things we'll emphasize today. Uh, just as a, a starting uh, reflection here, uh, you know, uh, wet weather is what really drives plant diseases, particularly the foliar diseases in most, most years. And uh, it, it's already easy to forget what the past growing season was like. But if we look at the, uh, you know, the planting and establishment months, um, we had a pretty good slug of rain in the early part of May, and then things really, really kind of dried out. Uh, we had much, if you look at the overall May to July period, we had reduced precipitation and uh, slightly warmer than average across the western half of the state here. Um, and then if we look at July, we got a big dump of rain, but uh, it came in literally in a dump of some pretty big doses. And as we look at the uh, second half, the maturation and the harvest period, um, we had fairly uh, normal or slightly warmer than normal temperature conditions. And uh, after that big dump of rain in July, uh, things pretty much dried out into harvest. So this carried through in effects on the, on the diseases we saw this year. Um, really diseases were not overall a major uh, impact on our crop yield or quality this year. Um, with that early uh, soil moisture uh, in May there, we did have some issues with seedling blights, particularly Pythium and Fusarium uh, seedling blights. Um, toward the end of the season, um, spurred on by those July rainfalls, we, we did have some local hot spots with northern leaf blight and gray leaf spot in pretty much the areas we usually see them. And they were locally severe, but overall in the state uh, and in the western region, um, they were less severe than, than normal. Um, and you lo look down this list, we had the usual cast of players, even, even a few things we don't see so often. Uh, like Holcus leaf, bacterial leaf spot, few, few instances of that. Um, we did see a little bit of bacterial soft rot in a few places, but overall uh, diseases were fairly low. Uh, you can correct me, I would welcome to do so, but so far what I'm hearing back from grain producers and grain buyers is that uh, mycotoxin contamination has been fairly minor in the grain. Some, uh, some hot uh, samples of silage, however, and I'll uh, talk about that again in a minute here. So uh, the usual players, nothing unusual really in our spectrum, uh, northern leaf blight and gray leaf spot uh, continue to be the main fungal blights that we see. And these are, are uh, always more prominent in some of our river valley areas uh, in no-till no uh, continuous corn production situations. And that continues. Uh, rots, as I already mentioned, the incidence and, and severity have been uh, certainly not more than usual, maybe even a little less than usual. Uh, Gibberella ear rot, the red ear rot is the one we're uh, principally concerned about because of the possibility for the 
production of DON or vomitoxin and xerelinone toxins. Uh, hasn't been a big problem. We've seen a little bit of uh, fusarium ear rot with the typical starburst uh, symptom pattern on the kernels there. That's potential producer of fumonisin. Um, trichoderma is uh, more of kind of a secondary mold. We've seen a bit of that. That is not associated with uh, mycotoxin contamination. Um, we've had our, our share of stalk rots, but I'd say overall less than, than in many years. Um, gibberella stock rot, which uh, has the potential to produce uh, mycotoxins in the Stover fraction of uh, silage. Um, we have seen a bit of that uh, in, in various stress situations. And this is, I think, the reason why we're seeing uh, some uh, deoxynovalanol, some Don in some of our silage where we may not have seen it in some of our, uh, in our, some of our grain because it's actually coming from infection in the, in the stalks rather than the ears. We've also seen a bit as typical of anthracnose stalk rot and a few areas uh, that had uh, these massive rains in, in July with creek banks overflowing into cornfields. We saw a little bit of bacterial stock rot this year as well. So I want to spend the bulk of the time talking about uh, kind of our, our, our new enemy at the gates here, uh, tar spot, a fungal pathogen. And I'm indebted very much to a number of my colleagues in the Midwestern states who've been battling this now for a few years, in particularly Darcy Talenko and, and Nathan Kleszewski. Um, the causal fungus of this is an organism called Phylochera, specifically Phylochera matis. Uh, Phylochera is a, is a very wide genus of, uh, of fungus. In fact, we find species of Phylochera on many of our forage grasses and wild grasses. Um, to this point, we believe that Phylochera matis is very specific to, uh, to corn in its host range, but really we have a lot to learn about that, to be frank. So what's typical uh, about this fungus and its pathogenesis on corn is these raised, very dark black, uh, sort of shiny uh, fruiting bodies called stromata. And uh, these stromata uh, are the source of sporulation for actually two different spore types of this fungus. And as you can see that the uh, ascospores are exuded in kind of a mucilage, that kind of orange mucilage that you see in the lower right in this picture. Um, as we talk about spread across the country, there's a lot of questions been raised about whether this could be seed borne. Uh, there is no direct evidence that it is born in the seed, but uh, it can certainly be transmitted with fragments of leaf tissue that might uh, contaminate the seed lot. So that, that mechanism is, uh, is a real possibility. Um, there's a very nice and simplistic um, uh, life cycle here, that, a nice drawing that uh, Darcy Talenko has put together here. If you start, start in the top middle, these are these very characteristic uh, 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 bodies here, the stromata. And those appear uh, on the leaves about uh, two weeks after infection has occurred. And uh, if the conditions are favorable, you can have repeating cycles of that every few weeks, uh, increasing of inoculum. At the end of the season, uh, the infected uh, leaf tissues, especially, they dry down in the field and they uh, are been shown to overwinter, the fungus overwinters in the infected residue in the form of these stromata on the leaves. And then the cycle is started all over again in the next season uh, when moisture returns and uh, you have warm conditions, uh, you, can, uh, you can start the whole cycle of spores to stromata all over again. So a nice series of uh, progression of symptoms here from the earliest uh, sort of yellowing uh, chlorotic symptoms on the leaves. You see the initial uh, appearance of these stromata and they become more intense. And eventually you'll see them wi widely scattered around the leaves there. You'll, you'll notice in the background there also some uh, gray leaf spot lesions on that same leaf. 
So, uh, you know, even at this stage, if you're out in a cornfield and looking at stubble, you could uh, find these stromata if you know how to look. Um, it can be confused with, uh, especially on uh, stubble, with the uh, black rust stage of common rust. Um, and if, if you look at, and also this kind of sooty mold fungi, but if you contrast the difference here in the middle, you see the larger size of those stromata and the much darker uh, black and raised appearance to them. So even now, uh, it's possible to locate this in fields. A little bit of the history here is really, a, so historically, this for many decades has been a problem in the highlands of South and Central America. So in 2015, it was a head scratcher that had appeared in, uh, in cornfields in Indiana and Illinois. Still don't know how that happened, uh, but it quickly established in that area and has not gone away. Uh, as you can see through these years, uh, we've added, uh, not, we're now up to 10 states plus Ontario where this has been confirmed. And if you look at, uh, at uh, Southwestern Ontario and uh, through the central part of Ohio, it's kind of tapping on the door there in Western New York. And I fully expect to see this in the next season or two. Uh, honestly, I thought we'd see it this year. Kind of a strange new occurrence there down in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's kind of isolated there, but it was found uh, in, a, in a variety plot there uh, by my colleague, uh, Alyssa Collins there um, in the summer of 2020. So it's something we expect to see. And if you look at the environmental conditions that are favorable for the development of this disease, which is fairly modest, uh, moderate temperatures, uh, about 75% relative humidity, takes about continuous seven hours of leaf wetness for infection. Um, all of these things, if you look in this risk map here, uh, it's very likely that Western New York Finger Lakes will, will be a place quite compatible for this fungus when and if it arrives. Just to stress the point that environment, particularly moist, uh, moderate temperature conditions are the really strong driver of tar spot. This is an interesting illustration um, from a colleague in, uh, in, at Michigan State in Michigan. Uh, this is a center pivot irrigation and you can see the non-irrigated uh, corners of this field that hadn't, uh, this entire field had been treated with uh, foliar fungicide at, uh, at R1 stage. Uh, but of course, in these corners of the pivots did not get uh, the extra irrigation. And you see that the uh, disease is far more severe in the irrigated portion of the field. Uh, it can be a very dramatic development, uh, almost an explosion of symptoms at the end of the season, uh, such as you see here um, from Indiana, uh, a difference in a canopy from the left to the right in two weeks from uh, mid-September to early October. Um, and that's not atypical of what we see sometimes with uh, some other diseases like northern leaf blight. So there's a, a great consortium of uh, cooperating plant pathologists and breeders across the Midwest and now other parts of the country. And there's some really interesting research going on and I'll give you some, some initial updates on, on a few of these things, but the point is we still have an awful lot to learn. I wanna start with talking about the utility of foliar fungicides in controlling uh, tar spot. And uh, I wanna thank the generosity of my colleagues, uh, Darcy Talenko, Martin Chilvers, Nathan Kleszewski and Damon Smith uh, from Midwestern States in, in sharing their initial data. And uh, they looked at uh, a number of uh, uh, of, of different fungicide chemistries. I kind of highlighted some in, in, um, in green there that are actually labeled and available to us in New York currently. But a lot of these are combination products with the group three and group 11 fungicides uh, mode of action and also some in the, uh, in the group seven uh, mode of action. So these are the, uh, the sterile and uh, synthesis inhibitor fungicides, the group three the uh, carboxamide uh, SDHI uh, inhibitors, the, the group 11 and the, the uh, uh, 
excuse me, group 11 is actually the, the quinone outside inhibitor uh, fungicides, the strabirulins, and the group sevens are the uh, SDHI fungicides. All right, so uh, I won't dwell on this, but they've looked at a lot of different corn hybrids. They've looked at all kinds of variations of planting dates, environment, et cetera. And I'm just gonna splash up some, some partial results from the last two growing seasons. And this, uh, this slide is from Darcy at Purdue in Indiana. And uh, what, what this really kind of illustrates in the true two years on your far left in each case is the uh, amount of necrosis, that is the amount of disease in the non-treated control. And you look for these various fungicide treatments and these are applications at the tassel emergent stage. And you can see the level of the brown bars um, uh, the reduction in disease, if you will, compared to the non-treated. And the green is kind of the inverse. This is uh, in late September. This is the stay green quality uh, of, uh, of these fungicide effects compared to the non-treated. You see in some cases it's rather dramatic. Uh, I like this slide from Darcy from one of her trials. Uh, she looks at the area under the disease curve and breaks it down for in the middle, the light blue there you see at the ear leaf level. And then you see two leaves below the ear leaf, the darker blue and the pinkish color, two, year, two uh, leaf positions above the ear leaf. And it shows again with the non-treated on your left, uh, the level of suppression of, uh, of leaf blighting. Now this is a similar graph, uh, but this is, a, this is a compilation of the data from all of those four states and uh, th with the various fungicides. And again, you can see that all of these fungicide materials have some effects um, in reducing the, uh, uh, the development of, of foliar disease. And in most cases, this was a gray leaf spot, but also some northern corn leaf blight. So if you look at, uh, at the data, now this is data uh, compiled from those different four states in 2020. Uh, if you look at the average yield of about 222 bushels per acre uh, for the four states there, you see uh, you know, you, you see a number of uh, instances where you had 12, 15 plus bushel per acre difference with the, uh, uh, with the application uh, at uh, tassel uh, emergent stage. And there's obviously some difference in efficacy of these fungicides. <clears throat> in summary, all of these fungicides tested over the two years have reduced tar spot compared to the non-treated. Um, starting to see some differences between these products and uh, there's more, more work planned in this regard. Um, I think it's very important to look at the interaction of uh, partially resistant hybrids with the fungicide and there's some good initial data coming together on this. I share a couple of slides here again from Darcy in Indiana and you can see uh, here where they had the, the the, the uh, P numbered uh, 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 hybrid is, is, has some partial resistance. Uh, the W hybrid uh, is quite susceptible. And you can see the uh, comparison of uh, application of fungicides across that with the Treva Pro uh, fungicide. And you can see the contrast uh, between the resistant and susceptible with the treatment or without. And here's another experiment also from Indiana showing uh, very similar trends. Um, so what, what they found at this point, and there's a lot of work yet to be done, is by using a moderately resistant hybrid, uh, you can significantly reduce tar spot over a very susceptible variety. Uh, again, I emphasize that everything has some degree of susceptibility at this point. Um, they found that a, a, a tassel emergence a VT application of Triva Pro, where what they used in a lot of these experiments could reduce tire spot in a susceptible hybrid. 
And in a resistant hybrid or part, I should say moderately resistant hybrid, it might not even be necessary. The resistance in some cases may get enough control. In other cases, a high disease pressure, uh, it's likely that both mechanisms would be needed. So here's maybe the important thing for New York is that uh, this is a list of the fungi, uh, foliar fungicides that are currently labeled in the state of New York. And I realize that uh, this list grows by the month. This is current as of December. Um, and from the group in the Midwest, this is their rating of eff efficacy so far. Um, good to very good, good. Uh, you'll notice Preaxer doesn't have uh, enough data to uh, put forth a rating there yet. But uh, the bottom line is we have some excellent uh, tools to use should we encounter tar spot New York this coming year. So uh, just to take home for our growers, uh, once this disease is here, it's going to stay and it's going to spread. It is not unlike the other episodic diseases we experience like white mold and soybean or fusarium head blight on small grains. So awareness is important uh, to trigger the management. Uh, scout your fields, pay attention to the weather. Um, and if anybody finds symptoms that resemble tire spot, take a picture, save some samples. Uh, we'd love to look at these in our lab or, or uh, you know, get in touch with, uh, with Mike or Jody and let them know what you're finding because we really want to track this thing down. So a couple of notes on the foliar fungicides in the Cornell guide, a couple of things that are noteworthy changes. There's a new product for corn there. The Top Guard EQ is, is new on that list. Um, also, uh, Moravis Neo uh, has now been labeled for suppression of ear rods caused by fusarium uh, when applied at uh, tassel to uh, uh, silk emergence stages. So that, that's a new uh, feature. And um, also Proline is labeled for suppression of Fusarium and Gibberella ear rots when it's applied at the R1 to R2 stages. So, so those are some new features there. I'd like to take the, the last uh, few minutes that I have with you today to talk about uh, some what I think is some exciting new development in the area of fungicide application to corn. And this is with a group three uh, fungicide uh, through Triafol, um, through uh, FMC Corporation. They have, uh, it's called the Zyway fungicides. Uh, currently their Zyway 3D uh, product is currently labeled in New York. Uh, and the Zyway LFR, which stands for liquid fertilizer ready. It's made to be combined with uh, liquid pop-up fertilizers. And these are both applied in the furrow. And what's exciting is that initial data is showing that they have roughly equivalent uh, foliar disease control activity to uh, foliar uh, fungicides applied at uh, tassel emergence. So it, it's really a new paradigm for disease control. So this is some data shared with, uh, by FMC, uh, looking at the actual levels uh, of the active ingredient fungicide here, um, flutriophol, in, in the various leaves and other parts of the plant um, at, the, uh, at the milk stage of the kernel milk stage. So these were, this was all applied in the furrow, and yet this high level of fungicide activity is present, particularly around the ear leaves, uh, above and below and at the ear leaf position at this stage. And that's kind of exciting because that's a level that is, is uh, considerably fungitoxic and active uh, against uh, particularly fungi like the gray leaf spot fungus and the northern leaf blight fungus. So uh, this is, a, and I, should, I, I know I'll get the question if I don't say it now, these materials are, uh, uh, are able to be applied on silage corn as well as, uh, as grain corn. Um, <coughs> the main uh, emphasis here is for control of gray leaf spot and northern leaf blight. There are other foliar diseases and smuts that there's activity on the label. Uh, I will add that uh, uh, doesn't seem to be very effective against southern rust, which is a problem we don't have at this point. 
I'm sure there is already a lot of interest in this. The, the contact with FMC for our area is Gail Drake, uh, if anybody cares to get in touch with, uh, with Gail. Um, so th these are some, uh, some photos uh, made available to me from FMC. And uh, this is a situation where there's a fairly dramatic effect on, uh, on yield. This is from Mannheim, Pennsylvania, down Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. A uh, fairly late planted hybrid for the, uh, in mid-June uh, and a, a fairly short season hybrid really maximizing the conditions for foliar disease. And uh, you see this dramatic difference in both uh, disease intensity in the canopy in the non-treated check above and the Zyway LFR uh, treated uh, plots on the bottom. So I'd like to show you now, I think a, a very interesting video from my colleague Kirsten Wise at the University of Kentucky, who's got a couple of years experience now uh, working with the Zyway fungicides. In 2019, we had Zyway in a couple different trials, um, a couple different hybrids with varying disease pressure. Our gray leaf spot uh, by the end of the season was about 5% severity, which is about the threshold where we would begin to see yield loss from that disease. Our northern corn leaf blight came in late, but we did have some pockets of severe disease um, ranging from about 5 to 35% disease severity. The Zyway treated plots that we saw in 2019, the level of disease control was comparable to where we had a foliar application at tasseling. And that was really interesting to me that we would see good levels of disease control from a product that was applied in furrow. I think there's benefits from having good dis foliar disease control with these in furrow applications. I think about farmers that have fields, um, particularly in Kentucky, that you may not be able to get an aerial applicator or ground application equipment in the field. Um, and having the infrared capability to provide some foliar disease control would be a benefit for those farmers in particular. Okay, uh, while I'm thinking of it, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, we don't have enough information at this point to know how this material might work against tar spot. Uh, in general, uh, solo uh, group three fungicides have not been highly effective against tar spot. So with that, Mike, I'll open it up to questions. Yeah, Gear, we got a couple questions in the, in the box there. Terrific. Um, the first one came in from the thing, Carl Zimmick asked, what are the implications of, of tar spot uh, for silage production? Um, okay, good question, Carl. Uh, at this point, there's, there's been no uh, evidence pointing to any uh, quality effects, if that's what you're getting at, nutritional quality effects. Um, don't have any evidence to that uh, on that score. There are no known mycotoxins associated with the tar spot fungus. So in those uh, areas, uh, it, it certainly is not a, a principal concern. Okay. Another one is similar to, gets in with the tar spot. Eric Zuber asks, can you rank the diseases for the effect of mycotoxins on corn silage? Where would tar spot fit in? Well, okay. So our, uh, as far as uh, mycotoxins, uh, our principal problems are the fusarium fungi. So the... Uh, in particular, Fusarium graminiarum, which is going to get in either through the uh, the root system into the into the the uh, stems, um, associated with the gibberella stalk rot, or through the ears through the silk channels, associated with uh, with gibberella ear rot. So the any of these foliar pathogens are are going to only really have the effect of putting more stress on the plant. They are they are not. Uh, sources of mycotoxins, but they could they could uh, induce stress that uh, would help the some of the uh, ear rots and, and uh, stem rots to uh, uh, to colonize the plant to a greater extent. 
but they're secondary as far as uh, mycotoxin effects. And a follow up to, to Eric asks, what effect would population day length and seed have on mycotoxin? Well, again, all those things uh, are going to affect the level of stress. And this is particularly important for the uh, gibberella stalk rot phase. Um, stress plants, and particularly ones with a fairly high yield potential, good ears, the tendency to want to make a big ear to fill out the grain, uh, but post, uh, post pollination stresses, uh, drought, insect damage, high populations, weed competition, all of those things are going to predispose uh, to have more stock rot development in general and gibberella stock rot in specific. Okay. Yeah, there's a couple other questions, but it's, it's 1136. I'm going to keep on time here. Can you hang around? Can you answer some questions in the... I'll be, I'll be glad to. I can, I've got another meeting coming up in a little bit, okay. but I'll, I'll do what... And if you see some leftovers... Uh, send there's, them. Two, there's two more in there. Yeah, I'll, I'll handle those. That's great. Fantastic, Thank you Gary. Much. Great job. Thank you. Thanks. All right. I want to keep us moving to our, our last presentation today. And, and Jody Putman is going to introduce our next speaker. So, Jody. All right. Thanks, Mike. There so you are. Next, okay. Yep. So, our next speaker is Dr. Kareen Ketterings. Dr. Kareen Ketterings initiates, initiated and leads the Cornell Nutrient Management Sphere Program, which is the Applied Research and Extension Program in Nutrient Management of Field Crops for the College of Agriculture and Life Science. And joining her today is Dr. Sinaj. Sha Juhan, who is a postdoc research associate, where his research focuses on developing corn grain and silage yield prediction models. It's all yours. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Jody. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm going to get started with the, the presentation, and uh, Sunash will take over uh, um, once we, uh, we get into the, the talk itself. So the title uh, is Turning Yield Data into Action. How much yield do we give up on headlands? Um, there is a bit of an intro that we will be starting with in terms of uh, importance of knowing yield itself, what we can do with that, and how we can collect data. And then uh, in the past, I've talked about the corn yield uh, projects uh, that we're currently undertaking and hopefully about to wrap up. We um, We'll give you a quick update on where we're at with that project before Sunash takes over and talks about uh, the core of our presentation here today. All right, so let's get started. Um, we recently released a new fact sheet on our website. It's this uh, fact sheet uh, 111 in the series, and it talks about the importance of knowing yields. And I briefly wanted to touch base on that uh, just to, to recognize the importance of knowing yield and what you can do if you have accurate yield data. First one on the list is tracking yield inventories and that doesn't need any explanation uh, further than just the statement here. The second one is uh, uh, whole farm nutrient mass balances. Um, farms that improve their balances over time tend to have e emphasized, uh, among other things, increased homegrown forages. And we're talking specifically about dairy farms in this case. So knowing yields helps you troubleshoot um, and identify some areas of improvement of these whole farm nutrient mass balances as well. Number three, calculate return on investment. It's obvious uh, when we deal with crop production, uh, knowing yield is important if we want to determine uh, uh, return on investments, uh, crop, crop management investments. Number four on the list is evaluation of trends and yields over time. That's important if we want to see if our management changes are doing anything. Um, it's also important to see how important weather changes are for, for yield um, over time. And that allows us to possibly set up our farming systems to be more resilient to those weather changes. Number five, matching soils to crops, oh, sorry, crops to soils. Uh, is an important one as well. Not all soils are equally uh, supportive in our crop production um, and being able to match the, the, the right crops with the right types of soils is, is important as well. Yield is important to know for that purpose as well as to determine the optimal crop rotations. That includes things like uh, which crops do I have in the rotation? Is it alfalfa? Is it hay? Is it a mixture? Is it something else? 
And also how many years do I retain of each of those crops? Is it three years of corn, four years of corn? Is it three years of hay, four years? Can I do five years of hay? Um, if we don't know the yields and, and can document a potential yield decline, uh, then it might be more difficult to determine when to terminate a rotation and or shift to another crop. Number seven on the list is field nutrient balances, an exciting area to be working on right now. Um, nutrient balances are basically, for a field, are basically description between the nutrients applied minus the nutrients removed with harvest, with the crop itself. And that allows us to identify where we might have opportunities to um, better align allocations with crop needs. Number eight is a traditional one, troubleshooting for low yields. If you know where the yields are low, you need to start to figure out why that is and do something about it, hopefully. Number nine, variable rate management. It's really important to know a yield for that, um, both to evaluate if it makes any difference and to uh, align nutrient allocation or resource allocation, uh, things like uh, population densities. Uh, yield is essential to uh, all of the, the, the models that are, are currently being uh, used to derive nitrogen guidelines as well. So really an important input for, for variable rate management as well. And the last one on the list is on farm testing. If you want to know if a different management strategy has an impact on yield or quality or return on investment, it really is important to know what the yield is in each of these comparisons. So knowing yields will help with on-farm testing and on-farm research as well. I want to point out with this slide that it's not just yield monitors that we're looking at in terms of collecting yield data. Yield monitors definitely have some advantages in, in terms of the information we get, and I'll address that in the next slide, but uh, we can also collect yields for various purposes by tallying loads and knowing as an average weight of loads, by doing yield checks in small areas in fields, by using truck skills, by using farm skills, and then of course the yield monitors. And it's not just yield in terms of, of wet biomass, it's also knowing what the dry matter content of that yield is. Uh, so hence the uh, display of, of uh, for example, the cost of tester here to determine that, uh, but it could be determined by sensors on the yield monitors as a harvester goes through the field on the go. So it's not just the yield monitors. Uh, we can do a lot of useful information at the farm level to address many of the items I had on the list of 10. If we have yields on a field scale basis uh, per field and don't have the spatial information, but if we do have spatial information, we can uh, get more precise with our management. Yield monitor data give us farm, field, and within field information. Uh, calibration, everybody that's operated a yield monitor will recognize uh, the need for calibration before you harvest. Um, it's also important to do the data cleaning after harvest as I've talked about many times in the past. And I just wanted to put up the next slide to remind people that we still have some funding in place that allow us to do training workshops with farmers and with uh, farm advisors. So if uh, you're interested in learning a little bit more about uh, data cleaning and developing your own data cleaning skills, feel free to get in touch. Thankful for the support from uh, Corn Growers, Northern New York Ag Development Program and uh, federal formula funds to be able to continue those training sessions. Quick update on the yield data uh, projects that we've been working on in the past several years. Um, those of you that have worked with uh, Cornell nitrogen guidelines for um, field crops know that uh, for corn specifically, we have the corn N equation that includes entering yield potentials based on soil type. And it was a, a list with book values for every soil type in the state of New York. We have about 600 soil types. Since 2000, it was also recognized that um, if a farm has their own yield data, that's always better than the user book values. So since 2000, for farms that have been under, under CAFA regulations, um, actual corn yields could also be used. Um, and at that time, when this was put in place as a multi-agent agreement, uh, it required three years of data. In 2018, there was a, a slight redefinition, uh, redefining of that yield potential uh, definition. And the current uh, 
uh, guidelines and approved upon policy for the state of New York is that if you have three to four years of data, you can uh, um, drop the lowest yielding year for the average while yield tracking continues. If you have five years of data, up to two low years can be dropped to determine a three year average. And if you have six or more data, we want to uh, get, we, we have a better chance of getting uh, appropriate yield potentials uh, by maintaining a rolling average for the most recent five years with the option to drop the two lowest yielding years from the average. So the farms that have participated in our yield potential um, projects, our yields database projects, get back reports that have farm field and soil type specific information. Uh, so far, they've always gotten their reports back on an annual basis, uh, at least for each year that they participated, the average farm yield. Uh, in example here, 23.4 tons 2019. Uh, with previous year averages. It also lists the yield per field. Here's some example of five uh, fields with, uh, with yield data ranging from a low of 13 to a high of almost nine, 29 tons. And they, for every field that has uh, multiple soil types, they get the yield per soil type in, um, in that particular field and the area that that field covered. All right. So since um, just before Christmas, we started generating multi-year reports as well to address that request to list what the yield potentials per field would be if we apply that three-year running average. Um, so the multi-year state reports that uh, several of the farms are getting now would list the number of harvests, the average yield uh, based on that earlier definition, and the average yield uh, with dropping the lowest year, if you have at least three years of data, and the average year with dropping two, yield, two years if you have at least five years of data. So this could be directly be used by the farms that, uh, that have uh, shared data with us and get these yield reports back. Where are we at right now? We have a little shy of 200,000 acres of uh, yield data, about 50-50 distribution of silage and grain. 80% of the database from the last five years. And we have roughly about 100, 90 to 100 soil types that have a decent amount of information for us to set um, yield potentials with. A couple of farms lost their data due to the usual um, issues of malfunctioning sensors during harvest season. Some lost data due to incorrect data storage and uh, lack of calibration where the data was just really not trustworthy. With that, we're going to shift over to the headland portion. I'm going to hand it over to uh, to Sunash. Go ahead, Sunash. Yeah. Thanks, Karin, uh, and thanks everyone. Uh, thanks, Jody, for the introduction. Uh, first of all, happy New Year, everyone. Uh, so, uh, myself, I'm Sunash Chajan. I'm a postdoctoral researcher working with uh, Karin for the past one year. So, this is my second time uh, attending this con congress. Um, so when I joined this team, I was, uh, my expertise is mostly on image analysis, but when I joined this team, I was not aware of any monitor data. So first project that was assigned to me was to evaluate how much we uh, lose yield in the headlands. So um, I was given, uh, like I, I was handling a lot of field monitor data and I got used to this. So I'll be sharing what we, what we have uh, discovered from the, this research. So as Quirin mentioned, uh, many uh, farms uh, participated in sharing the yield data. And uh, so for each farm, we give a farm specific reports, which had farm average yield per year with and without headlands and also field specific yields with and without headlands. So in the next slide, I'll be showing you what is with and without headlands. So um, uh, you see three figures here. The one on the left is what we uh, get from the yield monitor. So this is, uh, this is including the headland. And with the yield editor, that's a software we use for cleaning the yield data. We can just uh, select the outermost path, the out outermost pass. So the, those are headlands. So we click that, we select those points and remove those. So the one on the left A is the yield with headland and one on C is yield without headland. So we average the yield, the overall yield and overall uh, uh, production from uh, A and C, and we use that for further calculations. Next slide, Queen. 
so yeah, individual reports. So when we see this, uh, uh, the table shows an example for three, uh, just three fields. So the second column shows the, the whole field yield. That's the average yield of the whole field. That's, uh, that's what you uh, saw in A. And the third and the fourth column shows the yield without a uh, whole, uh, whole field yield with no headline. So in all the fields, in almost all the, all the fields, we saw a yield difference between uh, uh, the whole field and field without headline. We saw a uh, difference of around 0.1 to 0.6 uh, tons per acre. So for this uh, study, we have used uh, data from 63 farms that included around 2,600 fields representing around uh, 49,000 acres of, uh, of area, uh, half silage and half grain fields. So the reason why we see this yield difference is uh, shown in the next slide. Um, yeah, so there are three possible reasons for yield reduction in the headland. Uh, so the first reason is obviously the soil compaction. We use heavy machineries in the field. So, and also we have, we take multiple passes in the headland. So that causes soil compaction and it, reducts, it reduces the the yield and uh, the middle uh, figure that's a tree line competition so this particular uh, image was taken from google maps from a field station near cornell university so we have tree line uh, that competes with the main crop and uh, for the nutrients sunlight water and uh, and uh, and it reduces the yield in the edge of the field and obviously the third reason is the pest damage so in this uh, um, in uh, this image was shared by josh uh, Putman. So uh, he has showed me. Uh, he showed us the image of uh, deer uh, coming for a fine dinner on every day and uh, spoiling the crops and the headland. Since the edges of the field is qu uh, quite accessible for the uh, for the deer, it just first starts with the edge and uh, slowly encroaches the inside of the field. Next slide. Please. Um, so when we saw the, uh, when we just plotted the uh, average yield with headland and without headland, uh, the um, uh, can you see uh, as you see the dashed inclined line in the plot. So the points that are above the inclined the diagonal line uh, are shows that the non-headland uh, yield is more than the headland yield, and there are few points that are below this line. Those points indicate um, uh, indicate uh, that the non-headland were not that productive uh, because of some uh, uh, infield features like trees and alleyways and wet spots within uh, inside the field and also sometimes uh, uh, farmers prefer uh, harvesting in multiple directions one with a horizontal one with multiple directions so the center portion of the field gets compacted so that uh, affects the yield on the next year so those were the um, points that were below the line and the same trend was observed for corn grain and corn silage as well um, as we see here, uh, on an average, uh, we lose around 14% uh, for on grain yield and 16% on silage yield uh, uh, between headland and non-headland areas. Next slide. So what we came up with is, is a hypothetical situation called uh, that we termed as optimal field production. So this was defined as the production that could be obtained if the headland portion and non-headland portion uh, yielded the same. So this was a hypothetical situation. And with this, we wanted to uh, have a, a, a quantifiable parameter that's production gain. So this is a percentage improvement between the actual production that's being observed and the optimal production that's a hypothetical situation. So we see this percentage di difference and we have this value for each field that we had yield data for. So this production gain is the improvement between actual and optimal production. Next slide, please. So when uh, we uh, plotted this for all the for all the fields, so we see that uh, the uh, range, the range, uh, the distribution of data range from minus eight to minus uh, to uh, thirty-two percent for corn grain and minus eighteen to forty-two percent. But on an average, we saw that the production gain was at about four four percent for both corn grain and corn silage. And uh, it, uh, an interesting point to note is uh, with within our database we had around 25% of the corn grain fields and 28% of silage fields that had gains between five to 20%. So even though the 4% looks like a small number, but for a huge field, this 4% might uh, produces a bigger difference in on return on investment. Next slide. 
So uh, these, these are the uh, quantifiable parameter that we came up with. And uh, here, uh, what we recommend is if you, if the fields ha has, uh, the fields have large yield hit. So we can go for either of these three options, either repair the headland with any management practices like vertical tillage and subsoiling. So this would uh, possibly improve the overall productivity on, and return on investment in seed and other crop inputs. Uh, or uh, go for reducing the crop inputs on the headland instead of uh, not applying any nutrients on the headland. Or rotate the uh, crops instead of having main crop, go for any perennial hay crop and conservation uses. There is a possibility of uh, quantifying what happens with each of these parameters, but that was not uh, uh, the scope of the current study. But we are still um, planning to extend the study with more of economics, uh, including more of economics here. Next slide. So all these uh, results were uh, published on a peer-reviewed journal article in Agronomy Journal. So if you have a smartphone uh, right now, so you can just uh, scan the QR code over there to read the extension article that was published in What's Cropping Up, that was uh, published in November, I guess. And um, for the journal article, you can also go for the one below, the Agronomy Journal. Uh, next slide. With this, I will hand over to Quirin for his, for summarizing. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Anash. Um, so in, in summary, uh, there's multiple reasons why we could benefit from knowing the yield at the farm level, at the field level, and at the within field level. Um, yield can be obviously determined in various ways, and they will range from more accurate to less accurate, or less accurate to more accurate, um, from tallies to yield monitors, Yield monitors do have the benefit of supplying us with within field yield data. Um, and that is a benefit because that gives us opportunities to develop management zones to troubleshoot within the field a little bit better and um, to develop what we call yield stability uh, maps as well. Something I talked about in previous Corn Congress. Uh, they do require calibration and post collection data. Once again, the reminder that we are available for training sessions uh, for those interested in learning more about that. What Sunash has shown us uh, with uh, the tremendous supply of yield data to our program in the last uh, couple of years, we were able to identify that on the headland areas, we give up 14%. We uh, our yield is 14% lower for grain, 16% lower for silage. That's a that's a major yield uh, drop in the headlands compared to the inner portions of the fields. Uh, on average, uh, that translated in a potential yield gain, if we could do something about it, of 4%, uh, but with big ranges. Um, what it basically tells us is if we do have that kind of information, we can identify where we take the biggest yield hit and then search for our next bushels. Uh, that gives us the opportunity to, to, to target the fields that are most likely to pay off in terms of uh, addressing the yield hit on those headlines. And as the last statement here, it's always better to use farm specific data and not to rely on book values. So all of this is also showing us how important it is to continue to measure yield at any of the levels and to keep improving on our ability to do so. So to use farm yield data to guide management changes rather than, than book values. With that, uh, we've come to the end of what we had prepared to share with you. I want to thank uh, the, the farmers that have donated their yield data. I had the report back and um, did the tally yesterday. We had 26 farms that supplied silage data, 28 farms that supplied grain data over the over the past years. Uh, whole farm databases, tremendous resource for us to be using and working with to give you some valuable information back. I want to thank the consultants that have worked with the farmers to obtain data and share and give feedback on earlier uh, results. The extension indicators uh, within the the Cornell Cooperative Extension System, Cornell students that have joined us and learned how to do data cleaning. I tallied that up yesterday as we have about uh, eight students, uh, undergrad students have joined us over the last couple of years and learned how to how to process your data. And then our funding sources, the Northern New York Agri-Development Research 
Agriculture Development Program, Farm Viability Institute, Corn Growers Association, and NIFA, which is basically our federal formula funding. With that, I will uh, stop sharing and maybe we can entertain a few questions if there are uh, any. Yep, yeah, yeah, Karin and Sitsanaj, fantastic. Uh, great job on that. We do have a question. Uh, Michael Dennis says, have you looked at crop overlap or will you in yield impact? Uh, just to clarify that crop overlap, meaning um, what specifically is that? I mean, I think that sometimes lines don't always, always match up. Um, All right. So, so the idea of, of double rows or crossing rows throughout the fields. Um, yeah, I've got guys that these big fields sometimes every year they have a different, a different uh, line of, of cropping situations across these big fields that yeah. the corn last year and that where that corn ended is not just beans, it, it's overlapped into another crop. And so, you know, we're not seeing some consistency there. Maybe that's what he's, he's looking at. I can let Mike, I don't see him uh, following up with that. All right. Uh, in general, our, our um, data cleaning protocol addresses uh, some of the issues that happen at the edges of, of rows at the, at, when we turn with the harvesters. Um, that Those are notoriously resulting in, in unreliable data. Um, so the cleaning protocol takes care of that. Yeah, can you just hear planting overlap? Planting overlap, okay. Um, so our harvest data um, will not necessarily address planting overlap unless it is in, in one of those spots where slowing down or speeding up impacts the yield numbers. Um, hopefully that addresses the question. So now I should chime in if you have uh, anything to, uh, to add here, but... Uh, there's, there's a lot of information that we don't have about these fields. So we get the, the yield data, we can run through the data cleaning protocol. We cannot assign causes of uh, lower yields in some areas because we don't know the specifics of the fields. Uh, but what the data are showing us uh, in this particular study is that it might pay off to go and dive into more detail with some of these fields um, and answer those next level questions as to what's, ca what's causing it. And can we do something about it? All right. Well, well Q and Sanaj, I don't see any other questions. And you guys are perfectly on time. It's a couple of minutes after 12. And I tell you what, everybody, you made it through session one of Virtual Corn Congress. So congratulations to everybody there, um, you know, for making it through. Uh, we weren't sure how it was going to go. I thought that the presentations, all four, were excellent today. Uh, I've even had a couple comments come through me through text that they even like this better than being in person because they were able to focus on the presentation and get more out of it. Uh, the thing that I've seen that they're saying they do miss is the interaction with each other and with with uh, you know our exhibitors. So that's very understandable. But I would agree. You know, when you got it sitting in front of you, you get to focus, less distractions, and, and hopefully we're getting more out of it, ret retaining more of that information on there. So that's it for today. So what I'm going to do is we're going to put up the uh, the CCA codes. Um, and then everyone has to to sign out uh, like they did this morning in regards to the, the, the codes that's in the, the DC uh, checkout link that's going to be uh, in the chat. So you do the same thing. So you guys are all experts now. You went through the, the hassle of doing it this morning. You guys know what you're doing. Get in that link and get that done. And uh, I'll put the, the, the codes up for CCA. And um, for tomorrow, same setup for tomorrow, you know, 10 o'clock start, we'll, we'll probably open at 930. We'll open up so everybody can do their thing. Brandy will send out the link for tomorrow's meeting after lunch today. So look for that for tomorrow's meeting. It'll be a different link than today. And other than that, folks, I, I appreciate everybody uh, coming and we had a great group today. We'll see you tomorrow.